uh, next section, we're going to look at the latent variable of quotient classification. And for each of the three methods we're going to learn about, I'm going to show how we build a model first. The second one that I'm going to look at is not something that people normally do, but I think it is important for this course, and that's how you learn from the model, or what you can, can learn from the model. Thirdly, we'll look at how you use the model on a new data point, and that new data point either belongs to one class, or it belongs to one of the other classes, um, or it belongs to a new unknown class. And I'll show you how we detect those, those different situations, and then we'll have a little discussion on some of the advantages and disadvantages. And also for each one, I'll illustrate with a case study in the software that you can follow along. Okay, so like I said, we'll look at uh, three methods. The first one we're going to look at is just PCA on the data. That's an unsupervised classifier. That PCA model is only built on the observations we use. We don't use the fact that the observations belong to a single category. So we're going to rely on the data to separate itself. The two supervised classifiers that we're going to consider are Simca. Uh, Simca is, um, it happens to be the name of a software package for latent variable modeling. But in this case, Simca actually refers to the algorithm or classification, soft independent models for class analysis. And then we'll also look at PLSDA, PLS for discriminant analysis. So in this case, uh, these two cases is a supervised model. In other words, when you build the model, that's the student that's learning, the teacher that's training the model is the objective function for that model, and the training phase is building that model. Okay, so let's take a look at unsupervised classification using PCA. The idea is very, very straightforward. You simply take your data, you've got k columns here in the x matrix, and your rows have groupings. So your data from group one, your data from group two or class two, and then your data from your final class. Now, for convenience, I've illustrated then putting your first class at the top, your second class, and then the last class at the bottom. It doesn't have to be that way. In fact, we said that PCA does not use any knowledge of the class labels. So you can totally randomize the order here, or in the case where you don't even know what the classes are, there, of course, will be just in the order that you've collected the data. But just to illustrate it here, and only for illustration, I put group one first, followed by group two and group G, but it doesn't need to be that way. So we just build a PCA model. Nothing that you are uh, uncomfortable with, in the ways. And what we hope to find is that in that PCA model, when we look at the scores, we hope to see clustering. We hope to see one group different from the other group, and hopefully that clustering in the score space is separate. In other words, it's quite far apart. So if we're looking at T, let's say T2 versus T3, we're hoping to see one particular class over here, another class might be over here, and a, let's say a third class if we, we've got three classes in this data set will be over there. Okay. That would be the ideal case. And it doesn't necessarily have to be T2, T3. It could be T1, T2, T3, T4. Any particular score combination, we have to go look at these different combinations to find that and see that. But we're hoping to see that the very clear separation in the score space. And this, like I said, is the ideal. But the reality is, in most cases, we see these classes very close together, even overlapping. And you may not find in any of the score combinations a very clear distinction amongst the classes. And that's purely because PCA's objective function is what? Just to explain the variance in the data, it's got no knowledge of these classes, remember? So it, it, it's just splitting the data up in the directions of greatest variance. And hopefully those directions of greatest variance also split up the classes for you. But there's no there's no guarantee of that that's actually going to happen. Yeah. I don't know if this makes any sense at all. But whatever, if you did, so this would actually um, make about this so that the um, supervised, I think, but would it ever make sense to build deliberately on one group and then apply the same that model, like that set of loading 
things that get approved? If, like, would that ever give you better classification? So if you're building your PCA model just on the data from one country, yeah, yeah, that's actually what SimCode is, uh, the next method we're going to look at. But you're right, it's a supervised classifier because now you're using the knowledge of our class labels. Yeah. So here we don't know our class labels. If we do happen to have our class labels imported when we, in the software, we can color code. Right? So here I've not color coded, but I've drawn, used different shapes for group one, group two, group three. You would do the same. In the software, the, the colors or shapes, that, that just helps you to see the, the, the clustering, but it's not, I mean, it's just, a, it's a, just a visualization tool. It's not changing the model in any way. If we do find groupings like this, we can then go use the usual PCA um, tools available to us to understand why those groups separate. We would use a group to group contribution plot. So circle the, the observations from one group, circle the observations from another group, and ask for the contribution plot to understand what separates one group from the other. And remember, a contribution plot tells us which are the variables most associated with it, a shift in in the score space. So it's going to go back to the original x variables. So here we're in our latent variable space. This is not very useful to us to, to see, okay, it's one thing to see I've got a separation in T3, but I can't go back to my boss and tell me, tell him, you know, these things are different because they show differently in T3. We need to help him along a bit or her along a bit by converting back to real world observations, the, the k columns in our x which one or two or three or which grouping of those K columns are most associated with that particular change. We can do a group to group contribution between that group, that group. Any cluster we see in the, in the, in the score plot, we can go to do those group to group contributions. We can also use the loadings uh, instead of doing contributions. Yeah. What about the past time components, like, which are like away from the clusters, but you have, you have like, like right here, will you have to describe every point as a cluster in its own part? Okay, so you we're now what you're asking is the next step. How do we use this model in the future and to, to tell which which um, group an observation belongs to? Okay, here let's say we've imported our data, we find these three clusters, we know we've got three now. But you're saying what if we find points over here? Is that yeah, okay. So if you've only got a handful of points here, it's indicating to me, if I was building this model, I have a fourth class, but I only have two observations from it. Now, either those two points are outliers, maybe they should really belong to this group over here, but maybe there's something about them. We'll find sometimes, if, they, if these two observations have a lot of missing data, they don't project to the part of the score space they would have projected to. If those, value, those rows, two rows, were completely measured and had no missing data, they, they probably would have landed up here. But if you've got an extreme amount of missing data in it, just the missing data can throw us off and put us over here. Or it could be that the one or more of the x variables in, that, in those two observations would be correctly measured. So we'll, we'll probably see them over here on the score space, but hopefully we'll also see them on the SPE showing up as outliers. So what the PCA does is it's just telling us broadly how many groups we have. But yeah, it's not gonna it's not a definitive answer. There might be four four groups here, there might be three. In your case, you, it's hard to tell, right? With, without going to investigate those points in a little bit more detail. So let's take a look at an example uh, of the olive oil data. So here, uh, just to go back, it's a data set that's pretty been around for a while. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's very nice, it works well for this class. What we're doing is we've got measurements of eight fatty acids on 572 olive oil samples. And the data is divided, uh, sorry, the rows rather, are divided as coming from one of three groups, either the southern Italy, down here from north and south Apulia, or Calabria and Sicily, or Sardinia, or northern Italy. So, uh, so either coming up from this region over here, where yeah, there's Umbria, east and west Liguria, or the island, Sardinia, and this category is actually divided into two subcategories, inland and coastal. The first category is 
if you look at the data set, it's got groupings by major geographical groups, but then it's got another column that further divides this grouping into four subgroups. This is divided into two other subgroups, and this is divided into uh, one, two, three other subgroups. I'm not going to focus on the subgroups today. That's a, that's a, a, a hierarchical classification. We're going to first have to classify the denominator to group one, two, and three, and then go build another classifier to tell which subregion it comes from. Today, for the demonstration, I'm just going to look at group one versus two versus three, which is actually, it is an easier problem, but it's just, it's good to introduce the concept. So in the software, um, if you're going to follow along, uh, it's up to you. I'm going to assume you're not following along. Are uh, you mostly following along? Yeah, okay, okay, so I'll, I'll go slowly enough that you can keep pace. My first the line. I think it's the first switch, or the one on the right. Oh, there you go, thanks. So, there's the two columns I was referring to, the region and the area. Now, um, I've got an older version of data, I think you've got region marked as S, I, and N in the software. Okay, yeah, damn, I wish I had that one. Um, Wait a second, let me, let me get this, because then, then you can match with what I have. Um, So I'm just going to open olive oil, and you should see, yeah, there's S, I, and N. Select those first two columns and just create them as secondary variables. So what that does is the software now knows that they're not numeric values, they're identifiers that it's going to help set the class labels for you. Uh, if you look at the area column, it changes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 9, up to 8, indicating the 8 sub-areas. But uh, we're interested just in the region in this demonstration, S, I, or N. So say OK. You can import that as a block, finish that up. And these are eight, the, the, the level of eight fatty acids. Um, and for, if we scroll through the data, we can see that there is already some difference in those variables. Remember the S observations are first from southern Italy, then the I is from the island, and then the N from we can see, for example, here, this variable is likely going to play an important role in telling some of those groups apart, just from the raw data. But if we didn't know that, we could just we go ahead and say, OK, save that. We're going to build an initial model on all the observations. And it's just going to be a PCA model. If I go look at my variables, it only the PCA model is only going to use those eight variables. None of those eight variables have any I'm not telling the PCA model which grouping uh, each observation belongs to. So we're just hoping that we get natural clustering. Say OK. So order fit finds four components and T1, T2. Do you see any grouping over there? Sorry, solo. Okay, so we, we do we do actually have the color coding available to us, but if if we didn't, how many groupings would you say there were here? Four or five? Yeah, there's kind of one here, one here. T one, T two. We could go look at uh, four. Some people are saying we could go look at T three, T two. Not too helpful though. Uh, T two, T three, T four. Yes. Okay, that's definitely telling one class from maybe the others, one versus the rest. But it's, uh, yeah, so it, it, in this case, we don't get what are called type clustering. Uh, so T1 versus T2. So PCA, if we do see our, our clustering, it's often with the terminology used in the literature is type classes. The classes are very close together and, and uh, separate from each other. In this case, we don't have type clustering. 
we can maybe see one class, two, three, maybe four classes, but certainly not what's called type clustering. But let's uh, color code by um, that variable region. So the region, okay. And then we, we get the the appearance of it. Um, now I forget which or which. I think the green is from the island district point click. Yeah, these are the island observations. Black are from Black, I think, is from southern Italy and red is from northern Italy. So if I want to find out what the difference is between red versus green, it's simple matter to just do the contribution plot between those two groupings. Now, notice I'm not too picky about making sure I pick all the exact green observations and all the exact red observations. I just want a general idea for that spread. Okay, and it's telling me that uh, oleic and linoleic acid and some of the arid, I can't believe you pronounce that, one of the A, <laughs> um, are, the, are the, the three variables most most responsible for the separation. Let's of course go verify that. Uh, I like those two and you can uh, plot the rule of data for them. And it shows that quite clearly. So oleic acid is lower values uh, for that So oleic acid are those um, blue cluster over here, the red cluster from the northern Italy. And this is also, uh, while we're on this point, this is what brushing is, right? So brushing is when you select points in one plot, I select them in the scores, and it highlights them for me in another plot. I brushed those plots. Brushing, to me, the, the true meaning of brushing is when it's more dynamic, right? So I move my mouse in one plot and I see changes in the other. But this is a form of brushing, it's just a static. Okay, um, that's that's how you use a, an unsupervised PCA. We could go do group to group contributions between black versus green and uh, and the other third grouping, or we can simply just show the the line plot. So the line plot will superimpose the loadings and scores for us, and to make it a little bit more useful, we just go color code the line plot by region. And now we've got the loading superimposed. We can see that oleic acid, which was the one we looked at earlier, is strongly loaded in this first component. And the first component is separating red from green from black. It's not a perfect separator. That first direction is a very broad separation because we have black kind of going diagonally across here. But for the most part, all our red observations fall here, green observations there, black observations there. So any variables that load heavily in that P1 direction are variables responsible for separating the three classes for us. So oleic acid, palmitic acid, polvo to oleic acid, and linoleic acid over there. Stearic acid has no bearing in this first component. There's no, stearic acid is not going to help us at all to separate between those variables. Now, one thing why I, this, we're, what we're doing here is we're learning from data. Okay? So remember I said that I really find that important for this whole course, but also for this section. Most of these classical classifiers, k-nearest neighbors, linear description analysis, the more modern ones, support vector machines, neural networks, you will never see any discussion in their textbooks on learning more about your data. They just brute force go from your X data out and spit out the Y prediction treating it like a black box and the mathematics inside that black box. But at no time do they sit back and say, hang on, let's think about what we're doing here. If you do that, though, with latent variable methods, you can get a much more powerful interpretation. For example, what if palmitic acid is an extremely expensive variable to measure? It costs you $100 per sample, let's say. What, what are your options? Whatever that one is close to the linoleic or palmitic yeah. acid instead, would your model suffer? A little bit, maybe, but you can make an informed judgment here now, right? Uh, whereas normally you wouldn't be able to do that if you just treated it like a black box in and out. Okay, so spend some time investigating this. The other way is, let's say stearic acid is also super expensive to measure. It takes 10 days before the results come back. 
would you lose by leaving stearic acid out? No, because it's got no bearing in this particular direction, horizontal direction. Um, stearic acid, though, and linoleic, and this one that begins with the A, and isocenoic acid, they do help to separate out along the second component here between green and black over here. So from the islands to the northern Italy, while the first component is being used to separate in the horizontal direction. Okay, so that's the, that's the basics of unsupervised classification. I did omit one step though at the beginning, and that was to look at SPE on my training here. I should have just investigated that most of my points have got 500 odd here, so I do get a few above my limit, but not, not that many. Right, so my 99% limit, I expect about five or six data points above that limit. I've got about seven or so. Not a big deal. My SPEs have put no strong outliers <coughs> to my model here. Any questions on that before we move on? Uh, one thing to come back to here, just in the notes. I think we covered this already. Uh, PCA just explained the variance. So if we get the separation in the, in the score space, it's because the classes separate based on the directions of variance in the raw data. But there's no guarantee we're going to get that separation. But it is a reasonable assumption that uh, observations are going to be similar. If they cluster together in, in one region, we're, we're, based on what PCA is doing, projection onto a plane, that similar X observations will land up in the same cluster in the score space. So, and so that's a very reasonable assumption as why why this works. Now, if we wanted to use this on a new observation, it's a little harder because we have to basically go back to our score space and we have to build lines or regions in our score space to tell us where the boundaries are. And there's nothing that's automatic, automatic about it. It's a purely manual step. Okay. So if I had this model, where might you draw lines to separate red from green? Sorry? Yeah, a few of you have gone like straight lines. You don't have to draw straight lines. You can do any arbitrary curve, right? So anything is valid. Anything goes, as long as it's a helpful separator. So you could draw an arc like that, and maybe a diagonal like like that to separate green from black and red, and then an arc to separate green from red. Okay, so anything along those lines would, would be fair. Um, and what you're doing is you're, you're just trying to find those boundaries so you get minimal misclassification. One thing that's very, very useful to, to realize is that, um, like I, I've used this on a number of applications, sometimes it's more dangerous to misclassify one way than the other. So in this particular case, I'm going to draw my red boundary over there because if I've got a new observation coming in, I don't want to misclassify group A from B. So misclassifying a group A observation that really is from group A, if I mistakenly classify it as group B, that might be more economically serious or life-threatening if it's a medical situation, whatever the, the example is, uh, case might be. It's, there's many, many situations where the misclassification is asymmetrical. Most times um, it is asymmetrical. If it weren't asymmetrical, you would just put a line there so that you get roughly the same number of misclassifications on either side. But in most of the cases I've worked with, there's a lot of there's always an asymmetry in it. So you make one boundary more conservative than the other. So this fact that you have to draw your boundaries manually. It's neither an advantage nor a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage because you have to go do it manually, that's for sure. But the advantage is you can use these sort of soft constraints, like the fact that there's this asymmetry in the classification to your advantage and, and draw that boundary in the correct place, or in a place that makes more sense. If you had to leave a computer to do it, and the most objective functions for finding those boundaries are just so there's minimum misclassification in all classes. But if there's misclassification in one class is more costly than the other, it makes sense to have a boundary that, that accommodates that. 
The other problem we often have with unsupervised PCA is the, the model, you're building one model to explain everything, right? So you've got all your classes in one model. Now, if you've got the case where you've got like the CRA example, where they've got six different types of taxpayers, to find those separations between the six groupings, you often have to resort to adding many, many components that may not be significant by cross-validation. So they may often be seemingly noisy components. Just because you, to separate between the classes clearly, you'll, you'll need to resort to the higher components to do that. That makes the, the problem more combinatorial. You have to go through more combinations of T1, T2, T2, T3, and all the different combinations to find those boundaries. The other problem is that in many cases, you can't find a boundary in, a, in T, T1 versus T2 or T2 versus T3. Uh, sometimes the boundary is more clearly seen in T1 versus T2 versus T3. So you use a three-dimensional score plot. And you can have seen a plane that goes. So it's not always that the boundary is going to be apparent in Ti versus Tj. The boundary may be more apparent in Ti, J, and K on the three-dimensional score plot. Or sometimes it can be in a higher dimension that there is actually a separation. It's just you can't see it. Okay? So there are tools to use that, but the moment you start to use the class information, you don't have an unsupervised classifier. And now you're back to supervised. So we'll talk about those later. So we've got many classes that are not very separated from each other. This is probably not a good tool to use. Okay? So it's worthwhile remembering that as a disadvantage. Just many classes with strong overlap you're not going to see sufficient discrimination from a PCA, from a single PCA, because the objective function for PCA is to build one model to explain all the variants. Its objective function is not to discriminate. Okay, So you're, you're trying to use a different tool for the wrong job in that case. If, it, if PCA does work, you're lucky, right? would, be, would be what I would take from this. So if PCA does work for classification for you, great. It works well, for example, in this um, in this oil example. Yeah, you get fairly good separation, but there's many cases I've seen where a PCA just doesn't give you the required separation at all, and you have to resort to a, a, a supervised classifier. If you can look at that. Too. Uh, in fact, we saw a little bit of these. Uh, unsupervised classifiers in the last class in June's wavelet texture example that we looked at right at the end of the class remember he extracted um, 15 texture features from his images of good steel uh, bad steel and so on and when he did a PCA on those wavelet features they naturally separated out into bad, medium, good and excellent we noticed there was a bit of misclassification here between excellent and good but that was because of visually you take it all the two next together, you can barely notice the difference by eye. So it was even questionable, maybe there was an error in the training data. But um, here we, we found, just based on those features, a natural separation, and then uh, Jay drew those, those lines there to, to use as his separation feature. Now, one other thing before we move on is to identify an observation that could come from an entirely new class, you would use the SPE. So if a new observation came in and had a very high SPE, it doesn't belong to the model space that for all of your classes. It belongs to some other grouping that you've not identified before. So the way we pick that up is by using SPE. Remember I said at the start of the section, we're always going to look at how we can tell a new observation. Does it belong to one class or the other? The third of potential where place it could be classified is some new unknown class that we've never seen before. So we would use the SP for doing that. Then uh, just to wrap this section up, I just wanted to give an example. This is from a company that has combined classification with process monitoring. Okay. So they produce three different products on the same piece of equipment. And 
they want to monitor that, that equipment. So what they've done here is they've used T1 versus T2 to monitor. And to show the operators which particular, which particular uh, grade they're dealing with, they've put a few dots in the background here of previous good operation from those three grades. So there's the green, the red, and the blue grade. And so if they're producing the green grade, firstly, they expect to be in the green region of the score plot. So they, they, they know which grade is currently running on the process because they have to adjust the settings for the equipment. So it's good for them to firstly get their settings correct. They, if they think anywhere where these previous green dots are, they know they're within the operating space for that grade. That, that's correct. Uh, similarly for red and blue. Now, the way they use this for monitoring is they know that they're operating okay as long as they're inside this ellipse and as long as they're superimposed on the region for the grade that they're currently running. So those two criteria are used for monitoring. I, firstly, I'm in the region I should be in, and secondly, I'm within the ellipse. There is also, uh, it's cut off here on the screenshot, that there's the SPE value, uh, which uh, basically is not reported to them unless it's, it's critical, uh, unless it's above the limit. So there's a third criteria there for monitoring. SPE, am I within the region where I should be, and am I within the T1, T2 ellipse? So here they're operating a little bit too close for comfort to that outer boundary, and they notice that. They also know, based on the underlying loadings, they've been told what to move to adjust vertically and what to move in, on the settings to adjust horizontally. They know that because you can see that the primary separation from green to red to blue is in the horizontal direction. So whatever variable you adjust to move horizontally is going to shift you in that way. But vertically, notice each class falls roughly into a vertical band here. Well, there's a, maybe a little bit of a diagonal there in red and blue. But generally, there's a, a left to right and a top to bottom. Top to bottom, they look, we look at the loadings plot and we know what to adjust to move in the, that direction. So there at 9.48, they knew they were a little bit too close. Uh, by 9.52, they made the process adjustments and shifted further down. So they're still within the green region, but they're now away from that boundary. Uh, this was a little later on in the day. Uh, they had made another shift in the process and they moved back up again. But at least they're still they're comfortable, right? So they, they know that they they can behave, uh, move around in any of that region as long as they're uh, within their lips. Now also, just from a process understanding point of view, when they look at this, the overlap between the red and the blue makes perfect sense to them. Those two grades are very, very close to each other. So there's very minor differences in the settings for those two grades. So it's not, it's not unexpected to see that overlap here. But the, the red versus the green is, um, is, a, is a fairly strong separation. So that's a nice application because it combines classification with process one. Okay, so now we're getting to what Brandon was asking about. Let's look at Simca. Soft independent, uh, soft independent modeling on class analogy is what the, what the acronym stands for. And the principle is very simple. It's a supervised classifier. So we are using our class information. We take our data for class one, and we build a single PCA model just on class one. We build a single PCA model for class two, and so on up until our final class. So one model, one PCA model per class. And I'll talk about using those models to learn from in a minute. But let's take a look at how you use this for a new observation to tell whether the observation belongs to class one, class two, etc., up to class G, or if it belongs to new group. Very straightforward, we bring the, the K observations in and we apply it to each model. So the more classes we have, the more times we have to apply it. But this is very, very quick. It's just a t is equal to x times p. That's all that it is, right? It's taking our x data, centering and scaling it, multiplying it by the loadings for that particular model. And we calculate from those uh, scores, we calculate the t squared, and we can calculate the sp value. And if both t squared and sp are below the 99 or 99, Five percent limit, whatever we choose, we know that an observation belongs to that particular group. 
what we should see then on the other classes is high SPE and T squared. For every one of the other classes we go through, we must see high SPE and we must see high T squared. Let's say the observation doesn't belong to any of these G particular classes. By the time we come here to the end, we still haven't classified it, so we're stuck. Right? We haven't been able to put it into group one, two, up to our final group. So our conclusion is this observation must come from some new type of operation we've never seen before. Maybe it's an outlier, maybe it really is a new group. Okay. Maybe there's some error with the way that the X data were acquired. Uh, that could also be a particular and it could also be an option. There's a problem though, because what if we get an observation that belongs to two classes? What if two, like let's say model one and model two, have low SP and low T squared? shown it there, but I, from a, I, if it does happen that way, would you be satisfied with that particular thing? No. Well, I think that's the problem with underlying like classification models, not so much with the new observation, because it means that the models have like the same correlation and the same basically center, right? So well, there's some overlap. Between there's them. overlap. Yeah. Right. Okay. So one way to, to visualize this is as follows. Um, what Simka is doing is, let's take the case where we've got three variables, x1, x2, x3. So it's very simple three inputs. And we've got two classes, class one and class two. Class one is a PCA model that happens to have just a single component. So there's the T1, P1 dimension. Class two is, a, is another PCA model, and it happens to have two components this time. Right? That's the other thing with Simca, we can build models with different number of components each time. They don't all have to have the same number of components. So it's an advantage because some groupings may need more than one component to explain them. Other groupings can get away with fewer components. So we just use as many components by cross-validation as, as needed. So class one over here, class two over here with two components. Now when you're saying that it has low T squared and low SPE, geometrically what that translates to is as follows. Let's take a look at this case here. Low T squared means that for a case where you've just got T1, T squared is equal to T1 squared divided by S1 squared. Okay. So low T squared is saying the same as T1 squared needs to be small. So it's just bounding T1 within that that this direction over there. So those are the two caps on the cylinder. Wherever those fall is our T squared bound. And SPE is the circular bound. SPE is nothing more than a distance away from the model plane. In this case, the model plane is a single line. It's a trivial PLS, PCA model. Single line. So the distance from that, we're saying SPE must be less than 99%. That circular distance around the line is the 99% distance, so form the okay. This one here, I try my best to try and draw this one, but it's basically it's a pancake around the, the T1, T2. So basically take T1, T2 model plane and extrude it up and extrude it down. That's your, that's your region that bounds that space for that model. So we're saying, here's my Hotelling's T squared ellipse, T1, T2. A little bit up above the model plane is SPE up there. A little bit down is my SPE limit at the bottom. So that kind of cylindrical, uh, elliptical cylindrical region is the bound for that particular group. Okay, question? Oh, yeah. Is, is it then scaled? It is scaled in the software, but here I've just drawn it back in real world oh, units for you. So maybe there's some. Yeah, there's also going to be some distortion there. So if we get a new observation that happens to belong to both groupings, so two models are claiming the observations belonging to it, it's indicating that these bounds for the SP and T squared are overlapping in some way in the original space. Okay? Again, coming back to the case where you don't have 
X data sufficient res with sufficient resolution to separate that out conclusively. Your X variables you happen to have measured are not strong enough to discriminate between your two classes. Okay. Yeah. No question. Couldn't you use the extent of one boundary and the extent of other another to declare that overlapping region as a new class? Uh, so you basically, yeah, you're trying to, you're saying the overlapped region is a third class. Yeah. Yeah. You could, but then you're making your problem actually more difficult because now your third class you have to go build a PCA model for it, and it's again, again, again have its own bounds that are not going to go over into the other two's original bounds originally. Okay, so I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, yeah, it might be that if you get a new observation coming in belonging to two classes, you might just say, yes, this belongs to a third category without building a model for it. That might be one option. So there's many different ways you could do this, yeah, right? I mean, if you just look at the, the actual values of t squared and SD, couldn't you then determine which model is better fit for that yeah. point? Absolutely. You could look at uh, t squared and SPE for the, for the first model, t squared and SPE for the second model. But remember, you can't compare SPE values and T squared values from one model to the next. There's no sense in doing that. So one thing you can do, though, is you say T squared divided by my T squared limit. Oh, right. Okay? So that forms a normalized statistic that ranges from 0 to 1. And you can look at SPE divided by SPE limit. And then you can find the one that those two values weighted, perhaps, or just unweighted is the lowest, and you, you make it belong to that grouping. So I can say there's a lot of freedom here. When I, we're talking about this, there's many different ways to structure your classifier. And when you take part in these competitions, like on Kaggle and stuff, a lot of the art of doing it is how you set up your classifiers, especially when you've got multiple class, multiple models, and where you set those limits is often where, 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 the, where the part comes in. The understanding the model though, that you're using is critical. Because if you don't understand your model and what, what it's doing here in a geometric way, there's no way you can go and figure out how you can make an improvement. If you're just using this as a black box and putting data in and I'm getting numbers out, you're not going to win. You have to understand what's going on here in order to make suitable iterations and improvements to your model. Question? Uh, what do you think that you've done Change the grouping, like for example, you change the grouping from okay, group one to group two from one group. Does it make a, a different result? You, uh, it wouldn't make it, uh, what it would do is it would expand the range of that new group would now expand a bigger range. But if your original objective was to classify between group one and group two, that's obviously not going to help. Right? But if, let's say there's group one, two, and three. You really didn't care to tell the difference between group one and two. As long as you can tell it doesn't belong to three. So let's say your problem is, I don't mind grouping one and two together because I just want to tell three versus the rest. That's okay. But if your aim is to tell group one from two from three, you, you have to keep the three groups separate. So sometimes we'll see that uh, building models one versus the rest. We'll take a look at it. Okay, so Simca uh, is soft, independent model in the class analogy. Why does it work? Well, it works because the principle is objects within a class are similar. So CRA, when they divided the taxpayers up into six groups, they know that each of those six groups has characteristics in common with each other. What is it? We can go look at those models and, and see what the characteristics are. What in each group, what is it that's predominantly in common amongst them. So that's what the analogy part comes from. It comes from the word analogous meaning similar. We also have an independent model for each class, a PCA for every single one of our groupings. And the word soft, the description soft up at the front, that's indicating that this method allows an observation to be classified in the future, not when, you, not when you're building the model, but when you're using the model in the future, that soft descriptor means a new observation can belong to more than one class. Some classifiers are what are called hard classifiers, is that they do not allow for that to happen. But Simca does 
have that allowance because of the way that we structure the models up here. And when we're using it in the future, we're just checking does it belong to one or the other. Um, and sometimes it may happen to belong to more than one. Okay, so there's the equations uh, for it. Very straightforward. You just project the new data. You center and scale for the G group. You use the G group centering and scaling uh, vector. Calculate x nu, x nu projects it onto the loadings for the G class, calculate the t's, the t's calculate SPE and t squared for those. Usually though, I find when we're looking at these simple models, we really only focus on SPE. And we can certainly look at t squared, but by and large, we just focus on SPE. So one way uh, that Cummins came up with a, with a plot that now we named after him in the 80s, he did he uses this plot to, to tell one class from the other. So it's a little bit uh, messy here, but let's take a look. The orange squares, these are from class A, and they were from the training data. And if we project those onto the model for class A, the training data for class A, they should all have low SPE. So SPE for model A is plotted here on the horizontal axis. And its 99% limit is this line up here. So the orange points lie below the 99% limit because they come from model A. And what we hope to see in the future, <coughs> testing data that do belong to class A, they should also have SPE that belong that's below the 99% limit for class A. Class B is shown on the vertical axis, the SPE for the second for the B class. And is its corresponding 99% limit or 95%, whichever you choose to use. So the training data for class B should fall below its limit as well as its testing data. The points that belong to neither class A or class B, what we hope to see, remember this, I should add here, you should add a note to yourself, this is ideally what we would like. We don't always get this in practice, but this is what we're aiming for. Testing data that belong neither to A or B should show high SPE for both class A and for class B. So they should be off here to that quadrant. The problem is we sometimes do see points over here. These are points that are claimed by both class A and class B. And those are the ones that we just we just had a bit of a discussion on earlier. Uh, what to do with those. Ideally we would like to see no points in this particular case. The other thing is we can really learn a lot from these models uh, for, from simple. Remember we've got one PCA model per class, so we should go to each of those PCA models and look at their loadings, look at their VIPs to understand what is it that makes the variable observations within the class similar, what do they have in common. Uh, and for one disadvantage of Simca, you can't really tell why the classes are different. Okay, because you've got one PCA model and another PCA model, you can't compare loadings from one model to the other model built, built on different observations like that. So that's a disadvantage. You, you can get this though by doing a PCA of both, like the, the one we started with, the unsupervised classifier. That will tell you why the class is separate. But a Simca model will not tell you why they're separate. It will tell you why they're, why they're similar, what, what it is that's in common with them what is the important P1, P2 directions within each model, but it will not tell you why the models are different from each other, the classes are different. The other really nice advantage is, let's say we go ahead and use our model, and in the future we discover there is some new class that we haven't thought of before when we built the model originally. We can easily go tack that on. We just go take observations belonging to that new class and build a PCA model just for those new observations. We don't have to go rebuild our, our other, other models that we had earlier on. So that's nice. Uh, and then we've had a little bit of discussion on this disadvantage. When two or more classes claim an observation, you could look at implementing a voting scheme like, uh, or weight those uh, weight the according in proportion to the SP, which we just mentioned there. Yeah. Would this method be really sensitive to uh, misclassification in the training data? Because if you had a misclassification in the training data, then wouldn't that skew the uh, like the direction explained by the uh, first principle component? Like, you know, yeah. Good point. Yeah. Uh, what, 
it does, if you've got an outlier or outliers in your training data, you'd have to go clean those up. Okay. Yeah. So it makes the problem you can it beforehand. Like you yeah. have, you just have to look at each one of those models. But it is combinatorial because if you've got eight group names, you've got to go look at PCML one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. And investigate each one of those. Right. Which coming back to anyone looking at robust methods for their course project, that's a really, really strong advantage for robust methods. Can have the model built by a robust tool so that you don't have to spend time in investigating every one of them. I've worked with projects or seen people work with projects where there'd be 32 classes. <laughs> There's absolutely no way you can go investigate those 32 classes. Um, so let's go take a look at this in the software before we, uh, and then we'll take a break and look at the final model. But in the, in the software, what you would do is Uh, we've got model, new model as and what we want to do is we want to efficiently exclude observations from the class we're currently dealing with. So let's say I want to build a model for class 1. I want to go exclude the data from class 2, 3, 4 and the other classes. So they've provided a nice utility for that in the software. If you go to the observations tab, under class uh, First, you have to set your classes, sorry. First, set your classes. Go set class uh, based on your secondary identifier called region, so create. So notice uh, that this class column currently is just live. There's no, the model doesn't know about the different categories. So by clicking create it, it's gonna create those categories for me. So it's created a class S, created a class I, and N, the South Island and North. Now I can go say class search. I want to search for my S class variables. Sorry, my S class observations, because I want to build a model for S for the southern islands, uh, southern provinces. So search for those, and then you invert your selection. So now it has highlighted I and N, and then exclude I and N. Okay, so you do it by exclusion. Just retain the, the class observations you're interested in. So this is a PCA model, okay. And it's a PCA model of fewer observations, so PCA on S ops. Okay. If I build that model now, four components, I'll just close these previous ones, add T1, T2 now. This is a PCA model just on the S. We don't expect to see any clustering here. Right? In this particular case, I remember I said though that this that each of the main regions are divided into sub-areas. So there is actually, um, we can go color code here by that variable called area, so apply. And we do see a bit of separation, that because, but normally we don't have that. In this case, it's, there's this hierarchy of clusters. But um, normally here, the S class should be a coherent, self-destructed class. And by investigating the loadings, P1, P2, we're, we're seeing the important variables for this class. In this case, we happen to use most of the variables, palmitic, palmitoleic acid, linoleic acid, and then the other groupings that really we're seeing a very strong separation between those variables in P1. All these variables are required to, def to model the class here. Um, like we said earlier, Brandon, we would uh, look at the SPE and T squared to make sure we're not biasing this model in any way by, by strong outliers. In this particular case, they aren't really Set. So we would then go build a model for S, we'd go build a model for I, and we'd go build a model for N. I'm not going to build those other two models now, but I'm going to show you how I would use the S model in the future. So I'm just going to do one step of the Simca um, approach. So go to model, sorry, under edit, and create a new prediction set. We want to bring in the, all the other observations. But we should see than as having high SPE for this particular model. So go to prediction sets, create a new prediction set. Um, so I'm gonna go all data. I'm gonna use all my data for my prediction set. Include those, say okay. And now when I go plot my score, uh, sorry, my SPE for my prediction set, Okay. 
I'm seeing my first 300 odd observations, these were my data from that S class. So they are, have low SP. These observations here are from class I and from class A. The island class, I think, is this grouping over here, and then N. So there's a bit of a problem here. These observations are being classified as belonging to the S class. Also, these over here are just below my 99%. So they're still not far away from this model. Okay. So that's a little bit of an issue over here. But remember, we said we look at SPE and T squared. Um, although I said normally we do just look at SPE because that's often where we do see the classification happen. But we can also look at T squared, which we haven't yet. So let's go look at T squared. But to make it a bit more efficient, I'm actually going to look at both simultaneously. I'm going to look at SPE versus T squared. So I'm going to plot one of the vertical axis, one of the horizontal axis. And now we, we see that separation much more clearly. Okay, so I'm plotting SPE on the vertical axis, T squared on my horizontal axis. Which points are which? Let's take a look. Um, go create table. And if I select these observations are here. Where did the island, the island data? Region, so color code by region? Yeah. Okay, nice. So we've got our black points, which are from the southern um, states, which we built our PCA model in. So they have low SP and low T squared. Oh, but that's a bit unfair because that is our training data, right? But our testing data were the red and the green points over here. So it's showing that our green points do give us high SP as expected. They do fall well away from one class. The red class is actually quite interesting showing a bit of overlap. They're being detected with high SPE for some of them, but others are being detected with high T squared, but low SPE. And that's because if you look at geographically, where the southern and the northern states, they're, they're, they're close to each other. So my guess would be these points over here are from regions that are close to that other, to the model building region. So the southern states over here, these northern regions are probably the southern northern states, is my guess. Doesn't that basically imply that the uh, northern has the same correlation structure, sort of, but just a different sort of sector point? That's what the SPE would say, yeah. Or, yeah I mean, the, T, the, the, high, the difference in T squared? Because since the SPE is the same, that means the correlation structure is the same. Yeah, so the lower SPE would indicate similar correlation structure. The fact that it's offset just means that it's probably sh shifted with a different sensory. You can go build the models for the other two classes and you see very similar behavior in SPE versus T squared for them. So I'm not going to do that, but it's just a combinatorial uh, thing and you would automate that in practice. But it's worth, worth doing for the first time you're learning something like this. I would recommend you go build the models for the island, for the island states and for the northern states and you build the same uh, plot, SPE versus T squared, just to verify that. Okay, let's take a, a break here. We've